We promise this isn't another video about the old knees from Victoria, but they're now sealed and waiting for their install sometime over the next couple weeks. This week's video is all about the diesel engine and all of the systems and considerations that need to be gone through and decided. So no boat building today, but if you're interested in the plans Steve and Alex have for Arabella's power plant, you'll want to listen in on the conversation. Before we get going, here are the main parts of the engine we'll be talking about today. Okay, this is the oil filter. Yeah. This is the raw water intake for the engine cooling. This is a fuel filter. Um, this is the oil pump because you can't really get underneath to drain the oil out of the pan. Uh, the fuel goes in here, and this is a little pump so you can prime, and that'll push the fuel through the fil through the line here into the fuel filter, out of the fuel filter, and into the motor. So we did enough research to select the motor for the boat and to build the engine beds and all of that, and since we selected the engine, we might as well have bought it. So we got the motor this past summer. And we dropped it in here on the engine beds. And then Brooke from Nanny was kind enough to come out and look over the engine with us and talk about the things that we need to do for install. Um, so, you know, what it needs for water intake, for the cooling, and for the exhaust, how much space that it needs around it, how much airflow it needs. Um, we talked about remote uh, locating fuel fuel filters and oil filters and that kind of thing so that they're easier to change out and do the maintenance on. And one of the nice things about a new build like this is we can do the interior kind of any way we want. So we can build the interior kind of around these systems. So by having the engine in here early, we can uh, play with a lot of things and set it up to be a very advantageous for this power plant. And since neither Alex or I are marine diesel specialists, uh, it was great to have Brooke come out and kind of talk through a little bit and just see what we need to think about and things to consider and options. And he will be back uh, with some more help at some point and we'll get this diesel installed and they're going to help us out through getting all those systems set up and in place. And that's going to be really awesome. We're looking forward to the help. How many times a day do you go up and down here? Don't want to know. <laughs> I'm uh, Brooke Strait with Kraft Power, and uh, we are the distributors for Nani Marine Diesel here on the east coast of the U.S. and eastern Canada. Um, I'm here today with the guys from Acorn to Arabella and their new Nani N450. Um, we chose this, or they chose this engine because it's a good replacement for the Perkins 4108. It's all mechanical engine, mechanically injected, um, weight to power, really nice unit. The performance should be great on this boat. Raw water. Where were you going? Where's your uh, sea chest going to be? Have you determined a location or is nope. it? Okay. They aren't even on the plans. It's not. Nope. All right. Atkin doesn't tell you where any of that stuff should go. All right. Yeah, he's just like put the motor in here. Excellent. The rest Perfect. is up to you. Nice. <laughs> so you're going to come in from wherever you decide to put your sea chest. Come up through uh, through the bottom of the boat and have some sort of a, um, like a clamshell scoop yep. uh, for the intake that will come up to a, a raw water filter to filter out any debris and then come back to your, to the uh, raw water on the engine. I mean, obviously would love to put in kind of as few through holes as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I think the only thing we really need water in for is going to be for the diesel and then just like a salt water tap for the, uh, for the sink for the galley. 
Okay. And then, other than that, I can't really think of any other reason that we would need it. Yep. Um, so with that, maybe we can put in just one through hole. I mean, the galley's right here. So yep. if we popped a through hole over here or over on that side, it would all be really, really close. And we could probably run the galley and this off of the same through hole, I would Oh, imagine. definitely. Yep. I mean, I guess for determining a location, we could talk to, to, uh, talk to some people or just look at similar boats also, you know, where, where they are, as long as it's unobstructed and you have some sort of a scoop. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. I would imagine kind of like somewhere in like here, where if the boat were to ever come out of the water and be on the hard, like that wouldn't be a spot that would be like rubbing against. Does yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And obviously just somewhere where, you know, if you're healed over, it's still below the waterline. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're whatever, in a blow and you're you want diesel power and you're healed over or hove to or whatever yeah you want to make sure that you're getting getting raw water to the motor for the engine placement um engine below the water line yeah it's definitely us yeah exactly <laughs> so this actually shows your raw water in yeah up to your raw water filter yep and then back down up into the engine okay it actually it shows the whole circuit and so then we come out of the engine into a, a siphon brake. So you're gonna have to have a siphon brake above the water line somewhere aft of here or back back this way. Um, which could be something where your your smaller hatch that dropped down, it could be right on the inside of that, maybe mounted to, to the bulkhead there. And then out to a water lock muffler, which would be a small, just a small water lock muffler that would be aft here before you're going out out the back of the boat okay um and that's something as well that we can help you uh source that i mean it's a you could just do do an inline water lock okay um and then wherever you're going to exit the boat as far as for the raw water out is there anything no. on the drawings for that now because no. it, it doesn't show for the uh the red what was the engine that the Red Wing? Yeah. I can go look real quick, but I don't think so. Oh, no, they do have the exhaust. Oh, they do? Yeah, it's just a dashed line to a circle on the port side uh, just after the cockpit. Exhaust. Oh, yeah. And exhaust. But he doesn't give you any indication of where to bring it in. As far as the raw water in. Yeah. And there's no through holes at all. Not that I can see. It's all 12 volt, right? It's t as far as like your house system and everything? Haven't gotten that far, but okay. that would be my assumption. Yeah. It's just to keep it, keep it real simple. Yeah. It's all, I mean, it, that's, it's, what are you going to have in here as far as just navigational equipment and yeah running lights nav equipment yeah that's it yeah yeah there's not going to be a microwave there won't be fresh water pumps there won't be hot fresh water heaters no air conditioning none of that nothing no hot water no you could pull hot water off of here okay maybe so that's one option okay. um yeah if you guys wanted wanted to have hot water showers or hot water um on board it's it's very simple so what would that look like it'd be well i can give you a drawing of it but you're gonna it's actually like there's a there's a a kit that we can supply okay and you're tapping into the into the circuit of the engine to just pull the hot water off of it so the, the water comes through heats it up and then comes back out and gotcha. go into a holding tank okay so um so we could have hot water when we were running the engine correct yeah yeah, yeah. and it you know it would last for however long you know depending on the, the temperature so from the factory here everything comes mounted nice and neatly on the front of the motor and i think we're going to rip all that apart <laughs> so we talked to brooke about it a little bit here is the fuel filter and you can imagine if you were to unscrew this there's a good chance that some diesel is going to come out of these lines and you're not really going to be able to catch it it's going to kind of run everywhere same thing down here here's the oil filter 
there's not a great way to get some sort of catchment underneath that. You're gonna open this up and that's gonna leak oil from out from underneath there. And this is the pump to pump the oil out. Um, since the, the pan's way down in the bottom buried in the boat, you have this handy pump. But as you can see, it's right next to the filter. It's kind of a knuckle buster. And then there's gonna be more fuel filters. So there's gonna be fuel filters that are in line before this one on the motor. Uh, so one of the things that we can do, being a new construction and not having some predetermined place that this has to live, is we can extend these hoses and we can mount this fuel filter like up here on a bulkhead and we can mount the oil pump right next to it and we can get, Brooks said they make an adapter that goes on for the oil filter here and some hose so we can bring the oil filter up and we can set it all up so that if you have to do an oil change you can super easily pump it out and you can put a bucket underneath the oil filter and unscrew that and catch everything. Same thing with the fuel filter and have this all be really, really easy to inspect and to maintain and to work on. Uh, Cause you know, just every time you do an oil change, if you're spilling a little oil in the bilge, it's not going to take long until your bilge is all oily. Same thing, spilling diesel, it's going to get in the wood. It's going to stink. Uh, so the more we can keep that, that clean and neat, and um, all my years on the farm and whatnot, I've learned that if things are easy to maintain, it'll actually get done. Uh, so just by making these systems super easy to do, uh, filters will get changed more often and oil will get changed more often and the motor will be that much happier for it. Uh, so it's pretty cool to know that we've got those things that we can do. And those are the big ones is going to be moving the fuel filter, moving the oil filter and uh, moving the pump here for the oil. We also want to make sure that we have really good access here to the water and tank. There's an impeller in here that drives the water pump and those impellers will eventually get, um, you know, they'll just wear away. They need to be replaced. So being able to get to this really easily and replace the impeller will be nice. A lot of installs for motors that I've seen, you pretty much be on your head trying to do the impeller or do the oil change and it's a real nightmare. And I think we can set this up so that it's, really, really easy to work on and, and have access to that. And so those are things that we're aiming to do. Yep. One of the things I learned like growing up on the farm and stuff is that if things are easy to maintain and they are easy to like keep an eye on, yep. they, ha they are maintained done. and they have yep. an eye kept on them. And if you like bury things and make it tough and make it messy to do, they just don't get done. They get put off. And I want to, since we have a gigantic blank slate. Yeah make it as easy as we can. No, I I agree 100%. I think uh, re remote mounting the filters would be, make it easier for you guys, make it, and then additionally make it clean. You know, like as we were just saying, have a drip pan under there. Yeah. Um, and that way you're not making a mess of the engine room when you uh, when you go to do it, an oil changer or swap out a fuel filter. And, and depending on where you're, where you're going to be at any given time, you know, what we were talking about before with the quality of the fuel, you yeah. know, you might be going through fuel filters or whatever, uh, if you're going to be in remote parts of the world. We will be. <laughs> uh, exactly. So having easy yeah. access to that is always a, uh, uh, very nice. And then you just a pretty simple system plan on having a, a, a house battery and then, a, a starting battery. Yeah. Okay. That's, I mean, I think that's, or maybe a couple house batteries. I don't know. It depends on what you're. Yeah. We've got ideas like for the house stuff. Um, since we're not going to be using much. Yeah. Um, we might use different kinds of batteries. Yeah. Have you heard of uh, goal zero? No. What's their company that make, um, like portable batteries uh -huh. for like taking out in, I don't know, in the back country or whatever. You actually have one right above your head there. Okay. See that thing? Oh yeah. Um, so they make them um, up to like, big batteries that yeah. can manage things. And a lot of people use them, like photographers will use them if they go out in the field yep. to run all of their stuff. So we're not sure if we're running in that direction, but there's definitely some avenues that we could do with that to not have it connected to like a starter battery. Yeah. I like the idea of having the, the boats batteries that mm -hmm. are like the important sacred batteries and like the goal zero batteries where it's like, oh, you're on the boat and you want to charge your cell phone? You can use that. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't have power? Sorry, you can't charge your cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because um, the nav and the, the engine are the really important things. Of course. So yep. they'll probably 
Yeah, I think the, the house and stuff, that'll all just be its own setup with the engine. Yeah. And then charge, but you'll charge it all off the alternator, off the engine. Yeah, and we'll probably put in some solar panels. Yeah. But with there being a tiller steer double ended catch, there's just not, there's not a great place to put like a big array. Not unless you had some sort of like. Huge tower off the stern. Yeah. But even then, the mizzen's in the way. Oh, yeah. Do you guys yeah. have a weather vane or. Will you have a... Yeah, we'll probably put on weather self-steering. Yeah. So that would even further you could mess that up. Jet, well, yeah. But you could have a power generator on there. Okay, yeah. Like, I mean, if you have something back there anyways, you could have some sort of a power generation on that as well. Um, but yeah, I think the primary charge for the motor batteries and the house batteries will, will become from when we run the diesel. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean... Not to complicate things, there is always the option. We could put a nut, you know, you could always add another alternator on there. Um, it's not that difficult. We have brackets where you could have a, another alternator on the other side. Um, I can't imagine we're going to have to generate that much power. No, how so, big is that alternator it that's on there? Sounds like you're it's pretty, pretty uh, minimalist. The, the alternator that's standard, it's a uh, hundred amp. Okay, that should be fine. Yeah. We run the house and the boat shop off a 100 amp panel. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and if we put in some solar panels, we can hook those up to trickle charge the batteries as well. Definitely, yeah. So. Um, yeah, some of the newer, like smaller solar stuff's pretty cool where they have, you know, just small panels where you could have them. You don't have to have everything together. You have small ones kind of remote. Yeah, that's kind of the idea is to get like a couple flexible ones that can go on the house top and yeah. then maybe a couple more flexible ones that you could like throw up on the floor deck on certain days and kind of prop them up, tie them up, move them around as things make sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, i surprised somebody doesn't have like a integrated panel into a sail yet. Well, people ask all the time why we didn't go with an electric motor. Oh, really? And the reason that we have that, I mean, we did a ton of research, was the regeneration. We're like, yeah, I mean, we were supposed to have thousands of pounds of internal ballast. She's a big enough boat. We could put in a big battery bank, especially when you consider you lose the fuel tanks, you lose the weight of the fuel, the engine's a lot smaller, the engine's a lot lighter. You make that up in batteries. Yep. Weight-wise, is not really much of a difference. Yeah. But if we're not going to be at a dock regularly, there's just not a good way to charge it to charge it unless you know and then you put in a diesel generator and then you're running the diesel generator to charge the batteries and the batteries throw on the motor and every time you convert it you're losing energy yeah so uh, yeah. i think it's awesome to have an electric motor but my thing is if i was sailing around the world i'd want to have uh, a simple mechanical engine where if it hits the fan, I can turn that thing on and, you know, beat into the wind or, you know, yeah. whatever. Keep the boat into the wind. And and Kubota is worldwide. I mean, it, literally, if you... Any place out there's a, a tractor, you exactly. can get Kubota you parts. Find a farmer that has been working on his tractor and he can help you. You yeah. know, it's like, it's, uh, it's universal, which is great. And I'm trying to think what else we need to go over. The prop guy, you should probably, I mean, if, if you're years out, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. But we can get you in touch with him so you can start, you know, looking into this. It will just be a like a three-bladed fixed wheel, right? You're not going to have any no, folding propellers. Three-bladed, it would be... Um, it would be nice if it was like uh, the one from Victoria, when you put it in reverse, the pitch changed. Yeah. And when you were sailing, the, they would just kind of feather oh, oh, it feathered out. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. That seems like it would be way more efficient yep. um, for sailing. And I've heard that when you go in your motor and you go in reverse, that that makes a world of difference. Yeah. Um, I know they cost a lot more, so I'll have to figure that out. Yeah. But that, no, that is, it is nice having the, having it feathered. And then this is a, um, a mechanical transmission, so you don't need a lock as far as, you know, so you're not freewheeling the, the wheel when you're sailing. Okay. So you just put it in reverse, lock it up, and, and you won't, won't have that, your wheel just spinning all the time. Who put, uh, who put all this together for you? 
What do you mean? Like as far as like your the, the for the engine beds, like the hardware for it. Did you guys make those? Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, you're talking about all the bronze work. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we did all that. That's great. So the engine beds are tied into the bronze floors of four frames. Yeah, it's solid. Yeah, if the uh, if the engine comes loose, we have you're in big, big, big trouble. Yeah, exactly. You have bigger <laughs> problems. Um, that's great. Yeah, you should be able to flip her upside down and shake her for 20 minutes, and the engine still should just be sitting right where it is. Nice. Turn it off before you do that. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have an oil pickup uh, at the top of the pan, although it does come that way. You can order it that way. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you get we uh, we make these in soulless versions. So they have to be able to, it's a, it's, they have to be able to run upside down okay. for like uh, lifeboats or rescue boats. Oh, okay. So although it's going to be quite a while before we do all the systems and get everything installed for the diesel and do a test run with it, uh, it's really great that Brooke was willing to come by and help talk through some of this information with us because we're always trying to think way in advance and kind of design things so that we got time to think about it and mull it over. So we've been talking about maybe cutting out this beam up here in the center and actually keel stepping the mizzen mast because the diesel is so much shorter than the motor we had in the plans. So that's an option. We got to kind of look at how that fits We figure out where we want to remote mount the filters to, uh, what kind of space we need around the motor. So how we build out the galley, how we build out the nav station over here, what we do for storage, where the cockpit is, how all that interacts. Uh, there's a lot going on back here, uh, so it's really great to have Brooks' insight and be able to have time to really think about this and mull it over before you have to really make any decisions and lock down the path that we're going to take, because there are a lot of different options to take and consider. Last couple weeks I've been doing a lot of kind of behind the scenes prep work and just getting materials laid out and ready and kind of handing the reins over to Alex and letting him get his woodworking chops back together. Uh, so he's been working really diligently on Victoria's knees and those are about ready to go into the boat. That'll be the first piece of Victoria inside Arabella, but there's a lot more to come. And big thanks to Brooke for stopping by and talking diesel with us. I've got a lot to chew on about that and think about how we want to set that up. And I'm going to do some of that thinking over the next little bit. A uh, friend and I are headed to the desert. We're going to go do a little mountain climbing. I'm going to get some change of scenery and just get out of here for a little bit. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, while I'm out playing in the mountains, Alex is gonna be here working on Arabella. He's gonna continue fitting these wood lodging knees and putting in the short beams for the house and getting ready so that hopefully when I get back, we'll be able to launch into building the house sides. As you can see, we ended up not doing the bronze lodging knees like we originally thought. We looked at the budget and bronze is expensive and our pockets just were not quite deep enough to do that. Uh, so we decided to go with some timber instead. It'll work just as well. Well, not, maybe not just as well, but it'll work plenty fine. Uh, and we're doing them out of locusts and oak crotch wood, so they'll be quite rot resistant. And uh, they are way cheaper than bronze. They're also faster and easier. So I think in the long run, it'll work out just fine. Uh, but we do have some big expenses coming up as we start to dive into the interior and putting all the systems together. We're not too far off from that. Uh, so if you've been following along, you know that we do the limited t-shirt campaigns from time to time. We've got one running right now. Uh, Scott from Glasgow and the Wooden Boat Experience did a great design for us. So you can check those out. Every t-shirt sale really helps us big time and lets us keep making these videos. Uh, and speaking of making the videos, uh, we are going to give Ben, our video editor, a very much earned and well-deserved week off. Ben edits a, a video for us every week. So unfortunately, unless Ben somehow does twice as much work one week, there's no real way for him to have a vacation. Um, so I'm going to go take a little time off. We're also going to give Ben a week off. So next week, there will not be a video. No video next week. Uh, but we'll be back to our normal scheduled program after that. And uh, it'll be Alex working on these short beams and the lodging knees and getting Victoria's knees installed in the boat. And I'll be back from the desert before you know it. So thanks for following. Thank you for all the support. And we'll see you soon.